Hello and welcome to the JTM USA Seminar. Our theme for tonight is Sacramental Marriage, the Foundation of the Family and Christ Church on Earth. It is recommended to have holy water, a lip-blessed candle, and Benedictine crucifix. This month, we prayerfully endeavor to consider sacramental marriage, the foundation of the family, and Christ's church on earth. In Genesis, we read, And God created man to his own image. To the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Wherefore a man shall leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be two in one flesh. Thus God brought forth his model of love on earth. It is the union of man and woman in the sacrament of holy matrimony that establishes God's order for all of mankind. It is the very bedrock of the family and Christ's holy church on earth. The sacramental nature of marriage is revealed in Christ's first public miracle at the wedding at Cana. Marriage is the very model of the sacrificial love of Christ on the cross. It is the total giving of oneself for another. It is the heavenly wellspring of the great blessing of children and their education as generation passes to generation. Though the truth has been revealed, humanity has again turned its back on God and embraced the Gnostic lie of the serpent in the garden, eating of the fruit of their own destruction. As St. Paul warned us in Romans 1, because that, when they knew God, they have not glorified him as God or given thanks, but became vain in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. For professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Objective truth has been denied, and the subjective tyranny of feelings now stands in its stead. Same-sex marriage, transgenderism, and the destruction of parental rights over their children are now mainstreamed into the culture. Even within the church, the wolves in sheep's clothing are now advancing Satan's agenda step by step to destroy true faith, marriage, and the family. Their mission to destroy the church and bring about a world in which man becomes his own God a slave to the new theology is built on the counterfeit lies of the evil one. We must stand firm in the truth. Let us reflect on these excerpts from Christ's message of July 6 of 2011. On the importance of the sacraments. Today, my daughter, I wish to remind all of my followers of the importance of prayer to ease suffering in the world. Your prayers are now helping to avert many global disasters foretold. Prayer is the most powerful mitigation, and when set on behalf of others, they will be answered. While I am happy with those of strong faith, I am still fearful for those who are adverse to my divine light, the truth. Many people now wander around the world as if in a stupor, nothing brings them peace, nothing brings them joy. No amount of material comfort eases their pain. Their empty souls are lost. Please pray for them. Many laws were passed which offend me, especially the presentation of my Holy Eucharist by lay people. The lack of respect shown to me and my eternal father through new laws introduced to facilitate modern society has made me cry with sadness. 
The most holy Eucharist must be received on the tongue and not soiled by human hands. Yet this is precisely what my sacred servants have done. These laws were not passed by me in spirit. My sacred servants have been led down a path not in line with the teachings of my apostles. Today, my sacraments are not taken very seriously, especially those who seek the sacraments of matrimony and the First Holy Communion. The vow of matrimony is very serious. Remember, it is a sacrament and is made in the presence of God the Father. Yet for many, it is all about materialism and the exterior trappings. Many who receive the sacrament of matrimony do not acknowledge its importance thereafter. Many break their vows so easily. Why do they do this? Why pay lip service to the most holy union only to part soon afterwards? This is a mockery of one of the most important unions blessed by the hand of my eternal father. Many people do not pay any heed to my father's will that no man shall pull asunder such a union thereafter. Yet many people divorce, which is a law not recognized by my father. Divorce is an easy way to run from your responsibilities. All marriages are made in heaven. No man can destroy a marriage without offending my father. Remember, without the sacrament, your faith becomes weak. After a time, if your soul is bereft of my special blessings, it becomes dormant. All faith in me and my eternal father disappears in time with only a tiny flicker of recognition flaring up from time to time. Return to me through the sacraments. Show respect for the sacraments in the way you are supposed to, and you will truly feel my presence again. Remember the sacraments are there for a reason, for they are the nutrients you need for eternal life of the soul. Without them, your soul will die. I love you all. Please embrace me properly by respecting the Sacraments given to you as a gift from God, the Almighty Father, your loving Savior, King of mankind, Jesus Christ. Dear faithful remnant, we must stand firm in the eternal truth handed down to us from God. We must recognize the efforts of Satan's minions, both in society and the church, to destroy marriage the family, and the faith. Let us take up the weapons of our salvation and fight valiantly for the truths of God's kingdom. Tonight's outline, Sacramental Marriage, Teachings of the Holy Catholic Church. Sacramental Marriage, Pope Paul VI, Gaudium et Spes. Sacramental Marriage, The Family and Christ Church from the Book of Truth and crusade prayers. Sacramental marriage, the catechism of the Holy Catholic Church. The universal teachings of the Catholic Church, dating back to its founding by our Lord in the first century AD, are found in its catechism. The catechism is the organized presentation of the essential truths of Christ's church on earth in regards to both faith and morals. Its roots, it may be argued, hail back to the Didache, the first known instruction of the apostles to the Gentiles, 60 to 80 AD. The first formal printed summaries of the Church's teachings can be found in the works of St. Peter Canisius in 1555 AD and the published Roman Catechism of the Council of Trent in 1566 AD. We share with you now some key excerpts on sacramental marriage from the Church's Catechism. Catechism 1603. The intimate community of life and love which constitutes the married state has been established by the Creator and endowed by Him with its own proper laws. God Himself is the author of marriage. 
The vocation to marriage is written in the very nature of man and woman as they came from the hand of the Creator. Marriage is not a purely human institution, despite the many variations it may have undergone through the centuries in different cultures, social structures, and spiritual attitudes. The well being of the individual person and of both human and Christian society is closely bound up with the healthy state of conjugal and family life. Catechism 1604. God who created man out of love also calls him to love the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. For man is created in the image and likeness of God who is himself love. Since God created him man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. It is good, very good in the creator's eyes. And this love which God blesses is intended to be fruitful and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Catechism 1605. Holy Scripture affirms that man and woman were created for one another. It is not good that the man should be alone. The woman, flesh of his flesh, that is, his counterpart, his equal, his nearest in all things, is given to him by God as a helpmate. She thus represents God from whom comes our help. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. The Lord himself shows that this signifies an unbreakable union of their two lives by recalling what the plan of the Creator had been in the beginning. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Catechism 1609. In his mercy, God has not forsaken sinful man. The punishments consequent upon sin being in childbearing and toil in the sweat of your brow, also embody remedies that limit the damaging effects of sin. After the fall, marriage helps to overcome self-absorption, egoism, pursuit of one's own pleasure, and to open oneself to the other, to mutual aid, and to self-giving. Catechism 1614. In his preaching, Jesus unequivocally taught the original meaning of the union of man and woman as the Creator willed it from the beginning. Permission given by Moses to divorce one's wife was a concession to the hardness of hearts. Catechism 1615. By coming to restore the original order of creation disturbed by sin, he himself gives the strength and grace to live marriage in the new dimension of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage is a fruit of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. Catechism 1621. In the Latin rite, the celebration of marriage between two Catholic faithful normally takes place during Holy Mass because of the connection of all the sacraments with the Paschal mystery of Christ. In the Eucharist, the memorial of the new covenant is realized, the new covenant in which Christ has united himself forever to the church, his beloved bride for whom he gave himself up. It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other through the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for his church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating in the same body, and the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body, Christ. Catechism 1652. By its very nature, the institution of marriage and married love is ordered to the procreation and education of the offspring, and it is in them that it finds its crowning glory. 
children are the supreme gift of marriage and contribute greatly to the good of the parents themselves. Catechism 1653. The fruitfulness of conjugal love extends to the fruits of the moral, spiritual, and supernatural life that parents hand on to their children by education. Parents are the principal and first educators of their children. In this sense, the fundamental task of marriage and family is to be at the service of life. Catechism 1655. Christ chose to be born and grow up in the bosom of the holy family of Joseph and Mary. The church is nothing other than the family of God. From the beginning, the core of the church was often constituted by those who had become believers together with all their household. When they were converted, they desired that their whole household should be saved. These families who became believers were islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. Catechism 1656. In our own time, in a world often alien and even hostile to faith, believing families are of primary importance as centers of living, radiant faith. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council, using an ancient expression, calls the family the Ecclesia Domestica, domestic church. It is in the bosom of the family that parents are, by word and example, the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. Catechism 1661. The sacrament of marriage signifies the union of Christ and the church. It gives spouses the grace to love each other with the love with which Christ has loved his church. The grace of the sacrament thus perfects the human love of the spouses, strengthens their indissoluble unity, and sanctifies them on the way to eternal life. Sacramental Marriage from His Holiness Pope Paul VI, Gaudium et Spes. In 1965, His Holiness Pope Paul VI promulgated Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. It is one of the four constitutions resulting from the Second Vatican Council in it, His Holiness reflected on the importance of marriage and family, both in the world and in the life of the Church on Earth. For your consideration, we now share some of the central insights from this important document regarding our theme. The well-being of the individual person and of human and Christian society is intimately linked with the healthy condition of that community produced by marriage and family. Hence, Christians and all men who hold this community in high esteem sincerely rejoice in the various ways by which men today find help in fostering this community of love and perfecting its life, and by which parents are assisted in their lofty calling. Those who rejoice in such aids look for additional benefits from them and labor to bring them about. Yet the excellence of this institution is not everywhere reflected with equal brilliance, since polygamy, the plague of divorce, so-called free love, and other disfigurements have an obscuring effect. In addition, married love is too often profaned by excessive self-love, the worship of pleasure, and the illicit practices against human generation. Therefore, by presenting certain key points of church doctrine in a clearer light, this sacred synod wishes to offer guidance and support 
to those Christians and other men who are trying to preserve the holiness and to foster the natural dignity of the married state and its superlative value, the intimate partnership of married life and love has been established by the Creator and qualified by His laws and is rooted in the conjugal covenant of irrevocable personal consent. Hence, by that human act whereby spouses mutually bestow and accept each other, a relationship arises which, by divine will, and in the eyes of society too, is a lasting one for the good of the spouses and their offsprings, as well as of society. The existence of this sacred bond no longer depends on human decisions alone, for God himself is the author of matrimony. Endowed as it is with various benefits and purposes, all of these have a very decisive bearing on the continuation of the human race, on the personal development and eternal destiny of the individual members of a family, and on the dignity, stability, peace, and prosperity of the family itself and of human society as a whole. By their very nature, the institution of matrimony itself and conjugal love are ordained for the procreation and education of children and find in them their ultimate crown. Thus a man and a woman who by their compact of conjugal love are no longer two but one flesh. Matthew 19. They render mutual help and service to each other through an intimate union of their persons and of their actions. Through this union, they experience the meaning of their oneness and attain to it with growing perfection day by day, as a mutual gift of two persons, this intimate union and the good of the children impose total fidelity on the spouses and argue for an unbreakable oneness between them. Christ the Lord abundantly bless this many faceted love, welling up as it does from the fountain of divine love, and structured as it is on the model of his union with his church. For as God of old made himself present to his people through a covenant of love and fidelity, so now the Savior of men and the spouse of the church comes into the lives of married Christians through the sacrament of matrimony. He abides with them thereafter, so that just as he loved the church and handed himself over on her behalf, the spouses may love each other with perpetual fidelity through mutual self-bestowal. Authentic married love is caught up into divine love and is governed and enriched by Christ's redeeming power and the saving activity of the church so that this love may lead the spouses to God with powerful effect and may aid and strengthen them in the sublime office of being a father or a mother. For this reason, Christian spouses have a special sacrament by which they are fortified and receive a kind of consecration 
in the duties and dignity of their state. By virtue of this sacrament, as spouses fulfill their conjugal and family obligation, they are penetrated with the Spirit of Christ, which suffuses their whole lives with faith, hope, and charity. Thus, they increasingly advance the perfection of their own personalities as well as their mutual sanctification and hence contribute jointly to the glory of God. As a result, with their parents leading the way by example and family prayer, children and indeed everyone gathered around the family hearth will find a readier path to human maturity, salvation, and holiness. Grace with the dignity and office of fatherhood and motherhood, parents will energetically acquit themselves of a duty which devolves primarily on them, namely education and especially religious education. As living members of the family, children contribute in their own way to making their parents holy, for they will respond to the kindness of their parents with sentiments of gratitude, with love and trust. They will stand by them as children should when hardships overtake their parents and old age brings its loneliness. Widowhood, accepted bravely as a continuation of the marriage vocation, should be esteemed by all. Families, too, will share their spiritual riches generously with other families. Thus, the Christian family, which springs from marriage as a reflection of the loving covenant uniting Christ with the church and as a participation in that covenant will manifest to all men Christ's living presence in the world and the genuine nature of the church. This the family will do by the mutual love of the spouses by their generous fruitfulness, their solidarity and faithfulness, and by the loving way in which all members of the family assist one another. This love God has judged worthy of special gifts, healing, perfecting, and exalting gifts of grace and of charity. Such love merging the human with the divine leads the spouses to a free and mutual gift of themselves, a gift providing itself by gentle affection and by deed. Such love pervades the whole of their lives. Indeed, by its busy generosity, it grows better and grows greater. Sealed by mutual faithfulness and being allowed above all by Christ's sacrament, this love remains steadfastly true in body and in mind in bright days or dark. All those, therefore, who exercise influence over communities and social groups should work efficiently for the welfare of marriage and the family. Public authority should regard it as a sacred duty to recognize, protect, and promote the authentic nature, to shield public morality, and to favor the prosperity of home life. The right of parents to beget and educate their children in the bosom of the family must be safeguarded. 
children too, who unhappily lack the blessing of a family, should be protected by prudent legislation and various undertakings and assisted by the help they need. It devolves on priests, duly trained about family matters, to nurture the vocation of spouses by a variety of pastoral means, by preaching God's word, by liturgical worship, and by other spiritual aids to conjugal and family life, to sustain them sympathetically and patiently in difficulties, and to make them courageous through love, so that families which are truly illustrious can be formed. Thus, following Christ, who is the principle of life, by the sacrifices and joys of their vocation, and through their faithful love, married people can become witnesses of the mystery of love which the Lord revealed to the world by his dying, and he is rising up to life again. Sacramental Marriage, the Foundation of the Family and Christ Church on Earth, excerpts from the Book of Truth. God's holy word speaks clearly of our Lord's intervention during the end times, as he prepares the world for Christ's second coming and the great day of judgment. In the sixth century BC, God first revealed to the prophet Daniel a book, the Book of Truth. In it, God discloses to Daniel the events that shall befall the people in the latter days, and then commands Daniel that the book be sealed and only revealed at the time of the end. Later, in the first century A.D., God enveloped Christ's beloved apostle, St. John the Evangelist, in another mystical vision of the end times. The events disclosed to him were written upon a sealed scroll. Recorded in the book of Revelation, St. John was then instructed to eat the book written within and without, sealed with seven seals, for it could only be opened by Christ himself, the Lamb of God. Faithful to his promise, our Lord has now finally intervened to reveal the truth. Given to the prophet Daniel and St. John so long ago, through his beloved instrument, his final prophet, Maria Divine Mercy. Through this humble and devout Catholic prophet, God has lovingly unveiled his book of truth, comprised of 1,330 messages from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and our Most Blessed Mother. The book of truth is God's guide for his beloved children. Its insights are essential in helping humanity navigate the great tribulation that lies ahead as God's prophecies unfold. Let us heed Christ's words given to Maria on May 22, 2012. Take my gift, my holy word, my book of truth and devour it, for without it you will be like a body without a soul. When you swallow my words of wisdom, you will become whole again. When you become whole again, you will be ready to come with me into the new era of peace on earth. Let us, dear remnant, prayerfully heed our Lord's command as we explore the heavenly wisdom of the Book of Truth and its revelations regarding this month's theme, Sacramental Marriage, the Foundation of Family and the Church. The Foundation of God's Order of Love is found in marriage and the family. On April 8th of 2014, our Lord said to us, When Satan attacks humanity, his first focus will always be on the family, because the family represents all that is of my father. He will destroy marriages, change the meaning of what marriage is, encourage abortion, seduce people into committing suicide, 
and he will divide and break up families. Then he will destroy and break up my family, my church on earth. For that is what he swore he would do to me at the final hour. He has already begun to dismantle my church, and he will not stop until it is collapsed in a heap at my feet. My father has permitted a destroyer in the form of the Antichrist to do this, but only so far can he go. My church is my family, and while a large portion of God's children will leave to follow a restructured false church, many will still cling to me, and so my church, my body, cannot die. Your Jesus. Satan's rage against marriage, the family, and Christ's church will also manifest against priests. On December 23rd of 2012, Christ warned of the challenges they will face ahead. My dearly beloved daughter, many of those sacred servants of mine are to face a terrible challenge. This will be one which will convince them to take one of two separate paths. It will be up to each by his own free will as to which path he must choose, for the abomination will make itself known shortly. Many of my sacred servants will not be immediately aware of what is happening. It will only be when they read letters given to them from those in high places that they will find difficulty. Those who uphold my holy word, given to man through the gift of the Holy Bible, will be challenged and urged to accept amendments. These amendments will be given to them, and they will be expected to swallow them and accept them as the truth. They amount to one thing. They will urge those holy sacred servants of mine to accept tolerance of sin. They will be told that God is an ever-merciful God and that he loves everyone. Yes, this part is true. But then they will be instructed to condone laws, which are an abomination in my eyes. The family unit and the destruction of it will be at the root of everything. Others will be asked to accept a new type of ceremony, which will replace the Mass and the presence of my Holy Eucharist. It will be deemed an all-inclusive move to join all Christians and other religions as one. This will be the beginning of the end. The day the daily sacrifices of the Mass are cut will be the beginning of all the events to unfold, as foretold to John the Evangelist. It will be the time of the rise of the beast, and his influence will be great. He will win over the hearts and souls of many priests. His aim is to stop masses and to desecrate the Holy Eucharist. This battle within my church on earth will be vicious. Priest against priest, bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal. Your Jesus. On January 1st of 2013, Jesus revealed to Maria the extent of the enemy's attacks on the sacraments. It will, in time, become unacceptable for certain Christian practices to be held in public. These will include the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. They will be deemed to be unacceptable in a modern and secular world, and you will find it impossible to receive them. The sacrament of marriage will be changed, and marriage will be available in a different form. The only way to receive the true sacraments at that stage will be through the remnant church. To my sacred servants, who will suffer in my name, as they will struggle to hold on to the sacraments and the Holy Mass, know this. Your duty is to me through your holy vows, and you must never be tempted to deviate from the truth. Pressure will be put on you to desert the ways of the Lord. Your voice will be just like a whisper as the enemy tries to drown out the true word of God. Your Jesus. On August 5th of 2013, Christ warned us of the insidious plot to defile the sacraments and marriage in particular. 
so many arguments will be made in every nation in order to defile the sacrament of marriage. They, the enemies of God, want Christians to accept marriage between couples of the same sex, but they must never accept this, as it offends my father. It is not acceptable in his eyes. When they change the sacrament of baptism, they will remove all promises to renounce Satan, for they will declare these references to be old-fashioned and too frightening. They will say it is irrelevant. Then they will, bit by bit, introduce new versions of my teachings. In his message given to us on March 16th of 2012, Jesus lays bare the horrors of this plot to prepare us and to steal our resolve as we will have to witness the collapse of the Catholic orthodoxy. My dearly beloved daughter, the pain and suffering of my poor followers who have to watch helplessly as new laws, contrary to my teachings, are reaching unprecedented levels in the world. Not only do you have to witness sin, children, then you have to watch as sin is presented to you where you are forced to accept it as being humane. I refer to one sin in particular, same-sex marriage, which is presented as a natural right. You are then expected to accept this abomination as it is set before my father's throne in church. It is not enough for these people to condone same-sex marriage in the eyes of the law. They then want to force God the Father to give them his blessing. He could never do this, because it is a grave sin in his eyes. How dare these people think it is acceptable to parade this abominable act in my father's churches? Children, I love every soul. I love sinners. I detest their sin but I love the sinner. Same-sex sexual acts are not acceptable in my father's eyes. Pray for these souls, because I love them but cannot give them the graces they desire. They must know that no matter how much they try to condone same-sex marriages, they are not entitled to participate in the holy sacrament of marriage. A sacrament must come from God. The rules for receiving sacraments must stem from my Father's teachings. You cannot force my Father, God the Most High, to give his blessing or access to his holy sacraments unless they are respected in the way that they are meant to be. Sin is now presented in the world as a good thing. As I have said before, the world is back to front. Good is presented as evil and those who try to live by the laws of God the Father are sneered at. Evil, no matter how it is dressed up, cannot be turned into an act of goodness in the eyes of my Father. My Father will punish those who continue to flaunt this sin before him. Heed this warning, for your sins which are carried out when you refuse to obey God will not and cannot be forgiven. This is because you refuse to accept sin for what it is, your Savior, Jesus Christ. On Friday, February 15th of 2013, our Savior reminded us of the price he paid to free us from sin. It is his sacrifice alone that merits the grace of salvation. I gave up my life willingly to save you and free you from the chains to which you were bound by Satan and the fires of hell. But what does man do in today's world to repay me for this? Extraordinary gift. They try to justify sin in my eyes. They present offensive sins before me and plead with me to accept lies and untruths. Worse still, they want to adapt my holy sacraments in various ways to suit their needs and then present me with an abomination. All the laws of God are made in heaven. Sin is a sin in the eyes of God and can never be justified by human interpretation. Your Jesus. 
the importance of marriage and family in God's earthly church is reflected on our Lord's message of September 21st of 2014. We must recall that Christ himself manifested not as an individual sent on a mission with no one close to him, but within the Holy Family. God preserves his love for man through the family unit because it is within such circumstances that his love naturally thrives. The love contained within families who are united yields great graces because the love of family members for one another is one of the greatest gifts from God. God uses the love in the family to spread its wings so that each member of a loving family will help to spread this love wherever they go. Likewise, when the family unit breaks down, this will have a direct impact on your community, your society, and upon your nation. When God created Adam and Eve, he desired a family of his own upon which he lavished everything. He will always strive to protect families because this is the place where love is first discovered by mortal man. When love thrives in families, so too will it thrive in those nations. Because the love for one another evolved from the family, it is precisely for this reason that it is attacked by Satan. Satan will use every influence he can to infest people so that they will justify every reason to break up the family unit. He will prevent families from being formed, and he will try to stop it from reuniting, should that be the will of God. The family, born out of love of God, will always be attacked by evil. Your Jesus. In our final Book of Truth excerpt, we can see clearly how God, in his infinite wisdom, has placed the sanctity of marriage and the family at the very foundation of his son's church on earth and at the heart of our sacramental life. On December 25th of 2011, Christ shared this message. The family represents all that my eternal father wishes for his children on earth. Families, when together, create an intimate love known only in the heavens. Damage the family, and you will damage the pure love that exists within each soul, which is part of that family. Satan loves to divide families. Why? Because he knows that the kernel of love, essential to the spiritual growth of humanity, will die when the family is split. Please pray, children, for families to unite. Pray for families to pray together. Pray to keep Satan from entering your family home. Never forget that you are all part of my father's family, and you must emulate this unity on earth whenever possible. It is not always the case, I know, but strive always for family unity in order to retain love for one another. If you do not have a family on earth, then remember you are part of the family that my father created. Strive to join my father's family in the new era of peace. Pray for the graces needed to enable you to find your rightful home in this new paradise, which you will be invited to enter at my second coming. Your beloved Savior, Jesus, Savior of mankind. Let us, dear remnant, rise and defend the truths of marriage, family, and the church. Let us offer our prayers and sacrifices that God's will be done on earth. The Crusade of Prayer Prayer is beyond doubt the most powerful weapon the Lord gives us to conquer evil. 
we must really put ourselves into the prayer. It is not enough just to say the words. It must come from the heart. And also, prayer needs to be continuous. We must pray no matter what kind of situation we find ourselves in. The warfare we are engaged in is ongoing. And so our prayer must be ongoing also. St. Alphonsus Liguori. The blessing. We begin with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Invocation of the Saints. Mother of Salvation. Pray for us. Saints Peter and Paul. Pray for us. Saint Augustine. Pray for us. Saint Teresa of Avila. Pray for us. Saint Malachi. Pray for us. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. Saint Benedict. Pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas. Pray for us. Invocation of the Church Triumphant. We ask all the holy angels, archangels, saints, martyrs, and holy ones of God in heaven above to join us in these prayers and act as intercessors for us and our families. Amen. For Christ's forgiveness. Let us begin by asking for Christ's forgiveness. Jesus, forgive me, for I have sinned. Jesus, deliver us helpless sinners from your enemies. Crusade Prayer 96 to bless and protect our crusade prayer group. Oh, my dearest Jesus, please bless and protect us, your crusade prayer group, so that we become immune to the wicked assaults of the devil and to any evil spirits which may torment us in this sacred mission to save souls. May we remain loyal and strong as we persevere to keep your holy name before the world and never waver in our struggle to spread the truth of your holy word. Amen. Pray for Maria Divine Mercy. O glorious Father in heaven, hear our plea and our cry to you this day and every day. Bless the prophet that you have so lovingly sent to us to give us your words, your warning of mercy, your love. Grace her in abundance with the seven gifts of your Holy Spirit, so she may fulfill all that has been told and asked of her. She is but one amongst billions, whom you have chosen to help us achieve our rightful inheritance. Guide her to the fullness of your grace and the fulfillment of your Holy Scripture. Through the precious blood your Son shed, we ask your mighty eternal Father to bless her and strengthen her until all is complete. Amen. Crusade Prayer 33, the seal of the living God. O oh my God, my loving Father, I accept with love and gratitude your divine seal of protection. Your divinity encompasses my body and soul for eternity. I bow in humble thanksgiving and offer you my deep love and loyalty to you, my beloved Father. I beg you to protect me and my loved ones with a special seal. And I pledge my life to your service forever and ever. I love you, dear Father. I console you in these times, dear Father. I offer you the body, blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, in atonement for the sins of the world and for the salvation of all your children. Amen. Pray for each day. O oh, my precious Jesus, embrace me in your arms and allow my head to rest upon your shoulders so that you can raise me up to your glorious kingdom when the time is right. Allow your precious blood to flow over my heart that we can be united as one. Amen. Pray for the key to the new paradise. Dear Father, it is I, your lost child, who is so confused and blind that without your help, your love, I am nothing. Save me through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
and give me the key to your new paradise on earth. Amen. Pray to mitigate the circumstances of persecution which has been perpetrated behind closed doors. God the Father, in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, I beg of you to stop this abomination to control your children. Please protect all your children in these terrible times so that we may find peace and dignity to live our lives free from the evil one. Amen. Pray for the blind souls who are lost. God the Most High, I come before your throne this week to plead for the souls of my brothers and sisters who refuse to acknowledge your existence. I urge you to fill them with your graces so that they will open their hearts to listen to your most holy word. Amen. Pray to withstand the abomination which is on the way. O oh, my beloved Jesus, I invoke your protection and ask for your mercy to save my brothers and sisters within your church from falling victim to the Antichrist. Give me the graces and protect me with your armor of strength to stand up to the evil acts which may be perpetrated in your holy name. I beg for your mercy and pledge my allegiance to your holy name at all times. Amen. Theme Crusade Prayers Litany Prayer 1 Protection Against the False Prophet Dearest Jesus, save us from the deceit of the false prophet. Jesus, have mercy on us. Protect us from the persecution. Jesus, preserve us from the Antichrist. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Dearest Jesus, cover us with your precious blood. Dearest Jesus, open our eyes to the lies of the false prophet. Dearest Jesus, unite your church. Jesus, protect our sacraments. Jesus, don't let the false prophet divide your church. Dearest Jesus, help us to reject lies presented to us as the truth. Jesus, give us strength. Jesus, give us hope. Jesus, flood our souls with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, protect us from the beast. Jesus, give us the gift of discernment so we can follow the path of your true church at all times, forever and ever. Amen. Litany Prayer 2, for the grace of immunity. O Heavenly Father Most High, I love you, I honor you, Lord have mercy. Lord, forgive us our trespasses. I adore you, I praise you, I give you thanks for all your special graces. I beg you for the grace of immunity for my beloved. Name all those in a list for the salvation of souls. I offer you my loyalty at all times, you, O Most Heavenly Father, creator of all things, creator of the universe, creator of humanity. You are the source of all things. You are the source of love. You are love. I love you. I honor you. I lay myself before you. I beg for mercy for all souls who don't know you, who don't honor you, who reject your hand of mercy. I give myself to you in mind, body, and soul, so that you can take them into your arms, safe from evil. I ask you to open the gate of paradise, so that all your children can unite at last in the inheritance you have created for all of us. Amen. Crusade Prayer 60, Prayer for Conversion of Families During the Warning. O oh, dear Jesus, I beg for mercy for the souls of my family. Name them here. I offer you my sufferings, my trials, and my prayers to save their souls from the spirit of darkness. Let not one of these, your children, denounce you or reject your hand of mercy. Open their hearts to entwine with your sacred heart so that they can seek the forgiveness necessary to save them from the fires of hell. 
give them the chance to make amends so that they can be converted with the rays of your divine mercy. Amen. Crusade Prayer 85 To save the United States of America from the hand of the deceiver. O oh, dear Jesus, cover our nation with your most precious protection. Forgive us our sins against God's commandments. Help the American people to turn back to God. Open their minds to the true path of the Lord. Unlock their heart and hearts so that they will welcome your hand of mercy. Help this nation to stand up against the blasphemies which may be inflicted upon us to force us to deny your presence. We beseech you, Jesus, to save us, protect us from all harm, and embrace our people in your sacred heart. Amen. Crusade Prayer 122, Consecration to the Precious Blood of Jesus Christ. Dear Jesus, I ask you to consecrate me, my family, friends, and nation to the protection of your precious blood. You died for me and your wounds are my wounds as I gracefully accept the suffering which I will endure in the lead up to your second coming. I suffer with you, dear Jesus, as you try to gather all of God's children into your heart so that we will have eternal life. Cover me and all those who need your protection with your precious blood. Amen. Crusade Prayer 127 to save the soul and those of my loved ones. O oh Jesus, prepare me so I can come before you without shame. Help me and my loved ones to get ready to confess all our wrongdoings, to admit our shortcomings, to ask for forgiveness of all sins, to show love to those we have wronged, to beg for mercy, for salvation, to humble ourselves before you, so that on the day of the great illumination, my conscience and those of will be clear and that you will flood my soul with your divine mercy. Amen. Crusade Prayer 135 for the clergy to defend the truth. O oh, beloved mother of salvation, help me in my moment of need. Pray that I am blessed with the gifts poured down upon my unworthy soul by the power of the Holy Spirit to defend the truth at all times. Sustain me in every incident where I am asked to deny the truth, the word of God, the holy sacraments, and the most holy Eucharist. Help me to use the graces I receive to stand firm against the wickedness of Satan and all those poor souls he uses to defile your son, Jesus Christ. Help me in my hour of need. For the sake of souls, give me the courage to provide the sacraments to each child of God, when I may be forbidden by the enemies of God to do so. Amen. Crusade Prayer 167, protect my family. O oh God, my eternal Father, through the grace of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, please protect my family at all times from evil. Give us the strength to rise above evil intent and to remain unified in our love for you and one another. Sustain us through every trial and suffering we may endure and keep alive the love we have for each other so that we are in union with Jesus. Bless our families and give us the gift of love even in times of strife. Strengthen our love so that we may share the joy of our family with others so that your love may be shared with the whole world. Amen. Crusade Prayer 96, to bless and protect our Crusade Prayer group. Oh, my dearest Jesus, please bless and protect us, your Crusade Prayer group, so that we become immune to the wicked assaults of the devil and to any evil spirits which may torment us in this sacred mission to save souls. May we remain loyal and strong as we persevere to keep your holy name before the world and never waver in our struggle to spread the truth of your holy word. Amen. Final blessing. We close our time of prayer 
the sign of our faith, the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.